Hello everyone, welcome to another webinar promoted by Soft Expert. Today's event discusses about ISO 55000 standard and how asset management influences organizational objectives. The webinar will be conducted by Dr. John Ross, a certified maintenance reliability professional. Dr. John is a key recognized authority on maintenance storeroom development and operations and also author of two Amazon bestsellers. I wish you all a great webinar. Okay, good morning, everybody. Um, actually broadcasting from the United States and this particular standard hasn't quite um, gotten a real strong foothold over here in the USA. It's obviously uh, something that's got a lot of attention over in Europe appears to be a strong interest in it in the Middle East and in Africa as well. But it's just now working its way over to the uh, United States. In fact, I was at a meeting in October in, um, in the state of Kentucky. And at the time, there were only seven people that had this certification. So again, it's, it's relatively new. There's uh, a lot of people studying it, a lot of people trying to figure out uh, what the value is, it, uh, what the value of it is to them. But I can tell you, uh, this uh, particular document has uh, has a lot of potential for uh, organizations around the world. What it does is that uh, primarily it, it makes us all recognize in our organization, it helps us all recognize that we all have some responsibility towards our asset providing some value to the company. Now, ISO 55000 isn't just talking about physical assets. I'm, I, I'm assuming I may be talking to a lot of maintenance uh, professionals, a lot of engineers. It's not just written, it's not a maintenance program by any means. It's written to identify how we use all assets. Those could be real assets, they could be equipment, they could be proprietary information, they could be financial, non financial, could be people, human resources. So it's talking about how do we take the assets that we have that make the income for our company and how do we um, use those assets to deliver value for the company. But I'm going to be talking about today just generally how we um, can look at this uh, this new standard and how we can use it to benefit us on equipment reliability and availability. And so the physical assets, the capital equipment that we have in our organizations. And I can tell you too that since this is an ISO standard and many of you are probably uh, are participating or certified in many of the ISO standards. It's one of those programs that the standard gives you general guidelines. They're not meant to be prescriptive, like exactly do it this way. In fact, there's very little direct uh, instruction of what to do. It's open for interpretation. And like any ISO uh, standard, the idea is that you will read it, take the standards, figure out how you're gonna comply, be compliant with those standards, document that process and then execute that process and measure and evaluate how well you're doing against the process and then improve uh, pretty much your results. So it's like any other ISO standard, there's a lot for interpretation. What I'm gonna show you today is my interpretation. <clears throat> what I do working with companies around the world to set up asset management. I'm also gonna show you some pretty cool tools that I actually use. I think you'll find these very helpful. Uh, if you don't have a direct application for them, I think that you will find them to be very interesting. And as Andre said, you certainly will learn something new. But I do want to share with you, um, I, I, again, I travel around the world doing this, but I want to show you some of the tools that I actually use, and I think that you guys might benefit from those. <clears throat> so ISO 55000 is a very broad subject. There's a lot in the standards. I want to key in on three specific ones today. The first one is organizational objectives. And it has been my experience, <clears throat> excuse me, it's been my experience as I've traveled around that this is where most organizations get into trouble right at the beginning. What's important for us to set up an asset management uh, process or system is that we have a clear understanding of what the organizational objectives are. It's very possible that the next company I go to to set up asset management that the people I'm talking to don't have any idea what the organizational objectives are. And that may be true for some of you on the webinar today, if I ask you to list out what your organizational objectives are, you're probably in a position in the organization that really hasn't been explained to you what they are. Now you might know what, you may think you know what they are, but you might not have those down exactly. So it's important that top leadership, top management, uh, the organization, the uh, directors are very clear about what the company is trying to achieve because what we're gonna do 
is utilize our assets, in, in our case, our, our equipment, to achieve uh, those organizational objectives if we can. So we're going to talk about that. And then if that is the case, that we've got to use our physical assets to achieve organizational objectives, uh, how do we know which assets to include? Because ISO is very lenient in the sense that it, it allows us to pick which physical assets or which assets at all that we're going to use in this pursuit of this asset management and organizational objective. So it's really up to us. We just have to really have a process to identify it, identify the assets, and a real process to um, evaluate their performance and to improve on their performance. And then lastly, I want to end with the strategic uh, management plans. If, if you guys uh, have an asset management system and if you're compliant, uh, with ISO 55000, this strategic asset management plan is the document that an auditor or anybody, any stakeholder for that matter, is going to want to see. This is the document that actually translates the organizational objectives that I just mentioned into the actions that we take in maintenance. And there's only a few things we do in maintenance if you really think about it. We can do preventive maintenance and predictive maintenance. We do emergency or urgent maintenance based on whatever the situation is. We also do corrective maintenance, and in some cases, we run a component to failure as a business decision, run it to failure. The, S, the Strategic Asset Management Plan, or the SAMP, is the thing that tells us, um, translates the organizational objectives into the things that we actually do. And then I want to end by talking about some of those control activities. So that's how I see the agenda playing out today. And again, it's just a very small portion of the ISO standards. So just, a, a, I know Andre gave me a nice introduction. Andre, I certainly appreciate that. But just a little bit more about myself. Um, I've actually been in the business for 35 years. So I've uh, traveled the world. Again, I, uh, this is what I do for a living. But uh, I have had uh, great success publishing two books. Uh, both of these, uh, you see little pictures of them down here to the, uh, to the right. So both of these spent time as Amazon's number one new release. So I'm pretty uh, pretty proud of that accomplishment, and it's had some pretty good um, reviews, and I teach courses on both of these. Um, also, I've uh, been published in at least 15 periodical publications, and I've been very honored to uh, present at SMRP, the Society for Maintenance and Reliability Professional Conference, and been a keynote speaker on many occasions. I'm also a college professor. I teach uh, at North Carolina State University. They have a Diploma in Maintenance and Reliability Management. I'm the principal instructor for that. And then, uh, as you can see down at the bottom, CMRP and some other uh, notable accomplishments. So I, I feel like, as Andre said, not only do I do this for a living as far as teach and consult, but uh, I'm also a student. I, I learn quite a bit in research, quite a bit when I go to organizations to help them put together these kinds of programs. So as he said, we never stop learning because life continues to teach us lesson, lessons. So let's jump right into this. Uh, I just want you to know where my information is coming from because what I'd like you to challenge you guys to do is take what we talk about today. Again, this is my interpretation. This is the approach that I take. This is what I found to be successful for me. It might not be uh, perfect for you, but I want you to go back to the source documents primarily the three ISO standards. 55,000 is, is a standard on its own, but its complement standards are 55,001 and 55,002. So you'll want to have all three of those. Also, you can see my two books is where I'm pulling information from. Also, Learon has an exceptionally good asset management work practices training course. This is a webinar on ISO 55,000 asset management. Learon has a great five day course on asset management. It goes it goes further into uh, detail and also has a lot of exercises and case studies in it. So if you guys are interested in that, please check that out. And then Learon also has a really good life cycle cost webinar that I pulled some information for this at the tail end to show you guys some pretty neat tricks that you might be able to use or some, some tools that you guys might be able to use. So this is where the bulk of the information is coming from. Let's jump right into organizational objectives I mentioned before. This is the very first thing. If I was coming to work with your company and we were going to set up asset management, the very first thing I would ask is, what's your organizational objectives? And I don't want you to tell me. I want you to show me. I want to see the document that says, here are the three or four things that our company is all about. These are, these are the things that we're trying to achieve this year. And this is important because everything that we're going to do with our assets, and again, I'm talking about the equipment that we have, everything that we do, 
the maintenance, the operations, the care, the cleaning, the, the stocking of spare parts, everything that we do is going to be in an effort to achieve these organizational objectives. So it's important that we know that, first of all, and I would challenge uh, you guys uh, on the webinar, if you don't know your organizational objectives, if you've never seen them, to ask, uh, ask your uh, supervisor for them and see if you can get those. So understanding the direction of the company, this is first and foremost the most important thing. Companies are guided by what's called an organizational plan. It's also called a corporate plan. Uh, you may see those two words used uh, interchangeably. This plan includes a lot of stuff like finance and how we're gonna grow the business, but it also includes some really uh, important things that are spelled out specifically in the ISO documents. It identifies the values, uh, it talks about a vision and a mission, and then it gets down to the organizational objectives. And you can see a little uh, graph that I've drawn down here to the right-hand side to show some of those things that might be included in a corporate plan. I'm gonna start by talking about values. Uh, values help uh, organizations develop and hold uh, the policies and the direction uh, that is set. Values are what the company deems are the underlying principles of what's really important important to the organization. Now, sometimes we work for organizations that are huge, big, um, global oil and gas companies. So there's not really a, a face or a person that owns the company to say it's a corporate board. So it may be uh, maybe the values might be hidden, um, but it might be a private company or, or some financial investors that there's, there's people that we know, pictures that we see, and, and they articulate what's important to the company. Uh, the culture of the organization is partially described as a set of values and behaviors, and some of these are morality, ethics, honesty, integrity, and drive. So, what is the soul of the company? And this is the, what the company finds as valuable. Oil and gas companies find obviously the environmental preservation to be a great value. They wanna operate cleanly and, and uh, uh, transparently in the communities in which they operate. So it's important that we know these values of the company because as we're, again, as we're putting together our strategic plan for our assets, we need to understand what is the underlying principles of our company. So we're working our way towards organizational objectives. And as you can probably um, pick up already, the values are gonna help drive what our organizational objectives are. So the next thing I wanna talk about, again, we're just up in this organizational plan. And again, this is important. This is the very first place you're gonna start with asset management. What is the company all about? That's what we need to find out first so we can make sure that we're maintaining our physical assets in a direction that is complementary to what the company is trying to achieve. I find what's interesting is most folks down in the uh, organizational uh, structure don't have a clear understanding of what the vision of the company is. The, the vision, uh, again, some of this comes right out of the ISO standards. It's a manifestation of the potential for the company. It's not what we're going to be. It's a vision that the leader sees we're not going to be the best. We already are. The, the, the actual leader of the organization can, have, can see the vision in their mind and is leading the organization that direction. That direction. It describes what's actually happening in the future. And uh, I like to think that a vision statement is kind of like a lighthouse. If you're out in the ocean, you see a lighthouse. It's always a glowing point of reference. It, it'll lead us to a safe harbor. It keeps us away from rocks. It shows us where the land is but it's always a reference point. So we can always go back to the vision and understand what is, uh, what is the leadership of the company see as our future? I have a colleague, um, he said, uh, he, he uses this line quite a bit. I think it's a good one. A leader should never pass up an opportunity to go before their people and describe their vision for the organization. If we don't have a real sense of the vision, um, we don't have a real uh, innate sense of where we're going with this. And again, this is important when we're determining what we're going to do with our physical assets. We need to be pointed towards this lighthouse or this vision that I've been talking about. And before we get to organizational objectives, uh, well, let me just show you a couple of examples of um, some vision statements. I'll let you guys read these. But uh, when I'm helping companies set up their vision statement, uh, my instruction is that it's very short, no more than 10 words. You want a vision statement that people can remember, a vision statement that in, induces some passion in people, that they can see themselves in this future space. 
Uh, but if your vision statement is a whole lot of words and a whole lot of paragraphs, it, it gets it becomes white noise and nobody really understands what you're talking about. So as you can see from these vision examples, these are very short and to the point, and they talk about a future place that we're going to be. And as the leader, I'd be constantly reminding people, this is the direction we're going. This is where we're headed. The mission statement is a little bit different. And again, the, the standard spells this out. Uh, it talks about, um, uh, it, it ties the efforts of everyone engaged in asset management into a focused energy. The mission statement is, what are we trying to do here? What is our purpose of even being an organization? What is our purpose of producing our product or providing our service? It needs to make it very clear. So in that sense, a mission statement is longer than a vision statement because it's got to answer a couple of questions. And primarily the questions that a mission statement would answer are, who are we? What do we do? How do we do it? And who do we do it for? So a mission statement has to answer those four questions. So again, I'd ask everyone on the webinar, uh, if you give some thought to this, do you know what the values of your company are? Do you know what the vision and the mission statement of your organization are? And those set us up for the organizational objectives. And this is what the company says. This is what we're going to try to achieve. This is what we're going to focus on uh, for the next year. So here's an example of a good mission statement. I want to give you guys just a minute to read that. So I want you to pick up from that example mission statement that it answers the question, what's our purpose? What are we doing? It's really what it's asking. I just got this printed again, but I wanted to point out. It answers who we are, what do we do, how do we do it, and who do we do it for? That's what I've highlighted in red on this slide. So now that I've got my values understood, I've got my vision and my mission, I can now sit down at an organizational level, level and we can really um, express what our organizational objectives are for the year. This is a strategic plan, in a sense, for our organization for the next year. This is what we're going to do to be successful for this year. It talks about profitability, productivity, what our customer service is. There's some financial information in there, like cash flow, change management. Obviously, our companies are growing and evolving. How do we handle change? How do we communicate that? What's needed? How do we how do we alter uh, some of the things that we do to be successful in the future? Ultimately, we want to beat the competition. These are some examples of organizational objectives. Uh, now, the stakeholders. I'm going to use my stylus here. Sometimes my stylus turns the page for me, but stakeholders is the term. Next to organizational objectives, stakeholders is probably the the most common term you'll see in the ISO documents. Stakeholders, as we'll learn a little bit later, are anybody who can influence the company or who are affected by the company. They have their, their organizations, their entities, their people that have something to say about the direction that the company is going. And so what we have to consider in our organizational objectives, besides the values, the vision, and the mission, is what is the environment in which we operate? And I'll have a little bit more on that in a minute. Who are the influencers in our business and what are the things that are strategically important for us to focus on this year? And as you can see, I've kind of, I just went through these, I went through a couple of like traditional organizational objectives. There's a pretty good chance that all the folks on the webinar um, this afternoon, your organization is probably working as a focused energy on being profitable for the year, uh, increasing or at least holding productivity. I know we're kind of in a weird time right now, but productivity is very important. Customer service, you want to be seen as the go-to organization to buy a product or service. It's all about cash flow. If you guys are at all involved in the business side of it, you know that cash flow is king. That's what keeps the business, that's what keeps the business afloat. Change management, that again is engagement with our associates. And then we want to beat the competition. Very few people work for an organization that doesn't have any um, 
does not have a competitor. In fact, I, I've only ever met one person, one person, one singular person that worked for an organization that didn't have any competitors. So it's very rare that we don't have that. So there's a good chance that your company is trying to work on some of these. I, I don't recommend all of them as far as organizational objectives, but, but hopefully you guys are working on a few of those. So what we have to do now is make sure that the physical assets or the equipment in our company that we're responsible for is providing value towards these organizational objectives. And that's ultimately what ISO 55,000 or asset management is all about. So understanding the operating context is probably the next thing we work on. Once, once we understand what the organizational plan is or the corporate plan, the vision, the mission, the values, the organizational objectives, we now have to take a look at the environment in which we work and see what's really influencing us. What's making us make the decisions that we make? What are the governing uh, restrictions? What are the regulatory things? What are we allowed to do? Just in whatever country we happen to be operating in, you know, what, 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 can we, uh, what can we do and what are some things that we need to stay away from? So some internal examples of operating context might be the organizational culture. I do a lot of work, of course, in the United States. It's a different, um, it's a different, it's different people from the Southeast down in Florida and Georgia than it is up in Oregon and Washington. You know, it's a big country. So, you know, culturally people are different and the organizational culture might be a little bit more relaxed. Depending on what you make, I guess it could be a little bit more relaxed or it might be high tech. Uh, the environment, uh, labor unions, uh, I'm not sure where you are, if you actually have labor unions, we have some in the United States, so there's, you know, there's uh, collective bargaining, and then also we have to pay attention to budgets, most of us operate with a budget in mind, we've got to stay within a certain spend limit, external examples that might be applying some um, external pressure on decisions that we make, might be social, it might be cultural, depending again what country you're in. There might be some cultural things that you need to pay attention to. Economics, physical environments, you might be in a desert environment, you might be on the ocean, so you've got salt air things you got to deal with. You might be in the mountains, you might be in a rainy, uh, a very wet environment. And then regulatory and financial, so you've got some governments uh, uh, that you've got to pay attention to and some other sort of safety things that have to have to be considered. So we've got to understand in what context is our operation uh, working in. And what's interesting is that your organization might have an operating context, but each individual plant or location, again, I'm thinking about the big oil and gas companies I've worked with, uh, you know, wherever their corporate headquarters is, Houston, Texas or something, uh, they might also, they've got locations around the world. So you've got different sorts of things and the, the way that we manage, again, all assets, people, money, physical assets, land, all those things have to be taken into consideration in all the different locations that you are. I mentioned stakeholders is a highly used word. In fact, it probably is the most heavily used word in all the ISO standards. And it's really meant to identify the people who, are, who provide the internal and the external motivation for what we do. It's everyone who's affected by or who has influence over our company. And the standard is very clear. In fact, the standard says, the ISO standard says, that we have a responsibility to identify these stakeholders. I mean, literally list out who they are, and not, not by name, but the organization. Who are the stakeholders and what is their interest? And then we also are required by the standard to identify what their needs are. We have to ask them, what, you know, what is your interest in this? What do you need? What are your expectations from us running our asset management system? And we have to document that. So that's uh, that's a rare case where the ISO standard specifically says, "Thou, you know, thou shalt do this or thou must do this." And so you've got that documentation. Like all ISO standards, uh, ISO 55000 is heavy into the required documentation. You've got to write down what you do, and then you got to do what you've written down. So internal uh, examples may include employees, so associates of the organization, or certainly uh, stakeholders. Shareholders, so people that own stock, if you're publicly traded, or people that own the company, I should say the shareholders. Groups within the organization, you might have safety and engineering and quality. Uh, do a lot of work with food plants. They've got food safety. Do a lot of work with pharmaceuticals. They've got all their requirements as well. So all the different groups. And outside of the company, outside of the facility, outside of our headquarters, uh, we've got the customers. Uh, and this is very interesting because 
If you think about us identifying who our stakeholders are and what their needs and expectations are, it's not very often that a big company, even a small company for that matter, it's not often that a company reaches out to their customer, brings them into their boardroom, the customer, and says, and ask them what's important to them. Now, we might have a, a telephone or a hotline they can call with complaints and stuff, but the standard is really, at, ISO standards really asking us to identify the customers, the investors, suppliers, and vendors, and, and being transparent about how we're going to run, in this case, our physical assets, how we're going to maintain them, and to ask them what their thoughts, needs, and expectations are and to document that. You can see where it's very valuable to our customer and it's very valuable to our supplier as external um, stakeholders that we run a very successful business for the customer. They have access to our service or our product so they can they can buy what we sell. So they're very interested in us running a very successful business. Our suppliers and the local communities are very interested in us being very successful because the suppliers sell us stuff. That's how they make their money. The local communities get money from our tax base to to fund you know police departments and hospitals and things like schools and things like that. So it's important to these stakeholders that we run a very successful business. And the standard is asking us to include them in the discussions about how we're going to do this. So it's a very uh, a new con certainly a new concept in the United States. I can tell you that that's not something that we typically do, um, but it's uh, it's an interesting point. And I think it's one that's worth making. So what's governing this entire thing is the asset management system, and I, I don't want us to get too caught up in the asset management system because it's not. Uh, it's not a tangible thing It's that you can put your hand on. It's, it's really the manner in which you're going to control all of this. Uh, the last paragraph is probably the most noteworthy one on this page. Uh, an asset management system is a set of interrelated and interacting elements of an organization whose function is to establish the asset management policy, asset management objectives, and the processes. The asset management system, I like to think of it as all the different entities in the organization coming together for the benefit of ensuring the asset delivers value. So you've got an accounting uh, department, you've got an engineering department, you've got a maintenance department, a production or operations department, you've probably got safety and quality, human resources, uh, HR, you've got all these different things and they generally operate independently of each other and they've got their own systems. What ISO 55000 requires us to do is you still got those other things you've got to manage. There's no doubt about that. But on these particular assets that we're going to consider as part of our asset management um, program, these different entities have to come together and agree on how they're going to work together to ensure that those assets deliver on their value promise. So this is actually a good, even if you're not, um, a company that's trying to get a certification as an asset management company. This is a great concept for organizations to have generally. We need to come together and make sure we're all working in the same direction. And what asset management, uh, the standard says to us, not only do we have to evaluate the performance of our equipment and improve on it, we also have to have a, a, an effective audit system of our asset management system and to determine if it is delivering the, the sort of oversight and leadership and, and control of how we do things. And if not, we have to have some improve, documented improvement that we're taking. And so this is a very interesting concept. It's sort of how we're gonna manage uh, our assets. In fact, here's a little Venn diagram. This is right out of the ISO, this is right out of 55,000, ISO 55,000. You can see managing the organization is sort of the big enterprise. Asset management is everything, uh, all assets. Uh, and then we start talking about just the ones that we're considering for asset management. That's where we get into the two smaller circles. The asset portfolio, uh, we have a, one of the things we have working in our favor in asset management is we as an organization actually get to decide which assets are we going to consider as part of our asset management program. Not everything, but which ones are we going to consider? And then the asset management system, the circle right outside of that is, okay, how do all these agencies come together to manage everything that's required? You can see if we're dealing with uh, 150 different assets, I've got purchasing now that has to get with finance, that has to get with the storeroom, that has to get with engineering, that has to get with human resources and maintenance. 
we got to bring all these people together around those 150 assets. So this is a very important distinction uh, compared to what we currently have. Now, I, I'm not sure how you guys are structured, but again, I can tell you just my experience here in the U.S. We don't have this coming together around a certain number of assets that everybody's working to ensure that they're working uh, properly and delivering value for the company. So the asset management system requires, um, there's seven things, and I would be looking for these. If I was in your organization, I'd certainly be, I'd ask you to show me the documentation on these things. So these are sort of the seven elements. It's the context of the organization. We've already spent a little bit of time talking about that. Leadership, who are the top management, that they're, they've got to establish roles and responsibility. They have to resource the effort. Planning, support, operation. I've been talking about evaluations and improvement. Uh, so those are certainly at the tail end of this uh, elements number six and seven. On the context of the organization, I want to, in fact, the standard says we need to identify what are the internal and ex the internal and external influences on the environment in which we operate. If I understand the internal and external influences, I'm better able to control those, not, not in a, a controlling, like a mean kind of controlling, but control them to work in my favor. I can, in fact, I, I, I have a document that is a, um, like a stakeholder management document to help me understand what the stakeholders needs are, the way that I communicate with them, and then how I can help uh, to make sure that they're influencing, their influence has a positive effect on what I'm trying to do. I mentioned before this right here that an organization can have an operating context for the corporation but depending on where the different facilities are, there, you might have different sort. You might have different sorts of requirements locally, based on the culture or the laws or the, uh, the you know the available uh, human resources. You you have different training and skills might be some very uh, prevalent somewhere. Somewhere else you might be lacking some of those. So you got to pay attention to that. The influence of the stakeholders are key to setting consistent decision making. So one of the things that we're tasked to do and uh, asset management is to document our decision-making process. And this is something again, that might be missing for most organizations. Do you actually have a document that describes how your organization makes asset-based decisions? Do, do you know um, how long to depreciate an asset for? Are you able to determine how much money per year you should budget on each asset? Do you know when to get rid of an asset? When it's a, a lived past its useful life, how do we get rid of it? Uh, you may or may not know these things, but this, th this type of decision making has to be documented. And again, it has to be followed. That's all part of the write down what you do and then do what you say. This is interesting on the leadership side. The, it's, it's absolutely, it's the absolute necessity of uh, top management to define the values and the vision. We've already talked about that and to set the roles and responsibilities and who's accountable for what, and then ultimately the strategies. So the leadership has to provide this information in this direction, and it has to be done unambiguously. That means there's no confusion. And what's interesting, again, I'm just giving you my experience as I go to organizations to sort of provide this consulting service, the top, top management, has not provided this information. It's left for us, generally, if we're down the organizational chart, to, to seek the information, to go up the chain to try to find this stuff down. But if we're gonna be successful at asset management, and it kind of makes sense if you think about it, that the leadership or the top management of the organization explains to us what we're trying to achieve and resources us and determine what the roles and responsibilities of all the different agencies and different individuals are and ultimately lays out a strategy for us for the company. So now we can come up with really good um, asset management policies. That is how to say we're gonna use and care for the actual equipment. Unless we have this sort of guidance from our leadership, we're kind of left wondering exactly what it is we're trying to achieve. So this is very important asset management that leadership takes on this responsibility. In fact, they're required to do it. On planning, the asset, uh, uh, asset management system tells us that, uh, that the strategic asset management plan is developed in this planning stage. This is, again, if you, I don't know if you guys recall, um, the strategic asset management plan. This is ultimately what's a plan. 
what are we going to do with this equipment? How are we going to care for it? How long are we going to operate it? What's the useful life and possibly depreciation? How are we going to operate it? What are, what's our expected value in return? The strategic asset management plan is developed in the planning stage, and it is, it is quite honestly and literally the translation of the corporate objectives into the activities that we're actually going to do. So it tells us what's our plan and what are we going to do. As a matter of fact, it says right here, establishing what to do. So we'll have a little bit more on the strategic asset management plan here in a minute. In support, so imagine you've got all these different agencies coming together around these, in our example, 150 assets that are part of our asset portfolio. Well, these agencies have other responsibilities too. They've got documents to file and meetings to go to and all these other things. So it's very common that a lot of the resources that are used in the asset management system are also used in other places. When I'm talking about resources, I mean, at this point, I actually mean people and, and different systems for that matter. Uh, this, the support part of the asset management system explains how we're going to commit our resources and how we're going to share uh, these resources where they're needed. It also makes very clear on this last paragraph here, it makes it very clear what competencies are required in the resource being utilized. The ISO uh, standard makes it very clear that top management uh, will ensure and improve on the competencies of the resources. Now, in maintenance and engineering, I translate that to mean that we have a really good training program. We bring people, maintenance people into the organization. They have a certain skill base. We have a responsibility to have a really superior skill-based training program. So that's when I'm working with customers. That's what I take it to mean. And uh, that's what we set up a really good, uh, not only uh, skill-based training, but also competencies and asset management. So there's some supervisor and management training as well. So that's the, the support element. Operations, there's a whole lot in operations. I just pulled out the small part that talks about, if you think about this, we've got 150 assets. We're all working as an asset management system to make sure those are delivering on their value, you know, the return on investment that we were promised. We're all working towards their, the success of those assets. For the next 20 years, those assets are going to be here for 10, 15, 20 years. That's, you know, the depreciation range. It stands the reason that some issues are going to come up. Some things are going to change. There might be components no longer available for spare parts. We've got to make business decisions. And this is a great opportunity for risk to be introduced into the formula. And the operation element, it talks about we know this is going to happen. We have to have a process by which we can decrease the risk to the success of our company. Bad things are going to happen. We know that for the next 10, 15, 20 years, something's going to happen to that piece of equipment. We have to have our contingency plans, and we have to be able to stick to our asset management plan. And as things change, we have to change the asset management plan based on what actually changed. So this operation is just simply, how are you going to operate the asset management system? Not operations like equipment operations, but operation of the system. Performance evaluation. Um, this is an, again, this is one of those rare cases where the standard actually says thou shalt do this. Asset performance will be measured. In the example I set up at the beginning of this, I talked about having 150 assets. Uh, you are required to measure the performance of each of those assets. Now, things are going to be extremely good, or you're going to have some issues that you got to deal with some chronic failures and those kinds of things. But you have to uh, measure the performance of the assets. And also, as I mentioned earlier, we have to evaluate the performance of the asset management system, our ability to work together and cause um, assets to work properly and to provide a service. And I also need to talk about, uh, or, sorry, I need to also mention in my asset management system, when we set up these evaluations, we have to be spot on with our measures against what we're trying to do. I have to, have, uh, there's about 155 maintenance metrics. There's all kinds of other metrics. There's about 155 ma maintenance ones. I wanna make sure that the measurement I'm using is actually measuring what it is that I want. Because if I'm not getting that, I've gotta take corrective action or improvement to make that happen. I've got a current client, um, matter of fact, I've got a meeting with them today that is, is wanting to adopt a maintenance metric 
that I'm telling them is not going to give them what they want. So I'm kind of continuing the conversation, explaining what, why they don't want this number, they want to measure, they want a different measure. But I want to make sure that what I'm measuring is exactly what I want, because my improvement um, is going to say, if I improve on this number, I will get what I want. So I've got to make that connection. How does raising this metric improve asset viability or whatever my objective happens to be? So I've got to have a performance evaluation. And then this is that improvement. Uh, our asset management system is not static. Um, I, I'm measuring the performance of asset management. I'm measuring the performance of my actual assets. I've got to constantly or periodically, as the standard says, I have to constantly be coming back, assessing where I'm at, making some, and I guess, some strategic direction, making some improvement to get back on track, essentially. Uh, and so improvements are made as a result of the performance evaluation. It's like correcting the navigation on the ship is the example that I give. Well, I come in and I, I've got the, I'm steering the ship in a certain direction. Periodically, I check the map, check the GPS, see where I'm at, and make slight corrections to my ship, ultimately aiming to the port that I'm aiming at. And as I get closer, I'll see the lighthouse to tie in that metaphor from earlier. So that's the asset management system, kind of broken down into the um, seven different elements. But how do we know which assets to actually manage? I mean, I, I use the example of 150. How do we know which ones to use? If anyone's familiar with lean manufacturing, you've probably heard these terms before, product process flow and value stream mapping. I'm using those kind of synonymously to mean the same thing, even though they don't actually mean the same thing. It came out of lean manufacturing. I want to identify uh, what's value added and what's not value added. And so when I'm considering what assets to put in my asset portfolio, I want to take a look and see what are the assets that really impact my ability to make my product or deliver my service. Uh, I, I caution uh, organizations to keep from considering everything, the building, you know, air compressors and, and boilers and all those things, and really just focus in on maybe initially the manufacturing stuff that actually does the work because otherwise we would have hundreds of assets in our asset management system uh, to the point that it's completely unmanageable. I want to get down to the real essence of what where the product or the service is actually made. And what I'm ultimately looking at are what are the things that I can do to reduce delays, improve first pass yield if you're making a, if you're manufacturing a product, you want to make it right the first time. Increase throughput that is to improve productivity if you remember that might have been one of my corporate or organizational objectives. I want to eliminate bottlenecks, identify future concerns. So this really takes an organizational effort to sit down and consider all the assets that you have and really wean through those and pull out the ones that, are, that you would say, these are the ones that really matter. And that's going to be what's going to be included in my asset management uh, program. And again, I just kind of pointed out that we have, a, this is a real uh, benefit to us. Uh, it, asset management gives us complete control over what we're, we're including in the program and what is out of the program. All that the, all that the standard is asking us to do is explain our rationale. If an auditor or a customer or a vendor or somebody comes in and wants to talk about asset management, they're going to ask, how come you didn't include the boilers? How come you didn't include the air compressors? How come you didn't include, you know, some other fume collector, some other system maybe? We have to have our rationale, again, decision-making documented, and here's why we didn't do it. It's not, the standard doesn't tell you what's in or out. It tells you, you're, it's up to you. You just need to document what your rationale was. And then, again, live with that decision-making process. So for physical assets, which is what we're talking about. We're talking about plant equipment, maybe some tools, maybe some mobile equipment. And so these are the things that we're concentrating on as far as uh, on the maintenance and the engineering side. There's some other terms. I just threw these in here just to make you, just so you guys be familiar with them. The asset system is a set of systems that interact and interrelate. And when we're talking about asset type, we're talking about grouping assets together. It might be conveyors, might be ovens. Um, that, have, that shares some uh, characteristics among them. And so we might, instead of identifying that oven and that oven and that oven, we might just say ovens or compressors or turntables or 
uh, whatever the asset might happen to be. So we, we're giving a little bit of leniency on this. I pulled this together to talk about um, just process mapping because we could do product process flow or value stream mapping. A, a process map is a pictorial representation of a process's activities. This right here is, uh, this is actual the process for planning work in a maintenance organization. This is the uh, template of a world-class, um, in fact, this is the best in class for sure, process for planning maintenance work. It's very simple, but this is pretty much the flow chart of how it happens. Similar to that, that is a pictorial representation of a process. I want to be able to map out how my product flows or how my service is developed in my organization because that's now I'm getting down to the assets I need to consider for asset management. So when I think about manufacturing and service, I'm thinking about what's the equipment I'm actually using to make this happen. Uh, this is the process map uh, for, the, for making freight train wheels. So for a train, a freight train, the wheels that are on there are manufactured. Uh, obviously, they're made out of steel. Um, the, 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 the plant that makes them melts scrap steel and an electric arc furnace pours them into a mold. The mold has a curing time. The bottom of the mold is called the drag. The top of the mold is called a cope. It's split. The wheel's taken out and the wheel goes on for further processing. And the cope and the drag go on for further processing or refurbishment to come back around to the pouring station. This is essentially the, the little snapshot of how you make a freight train wheel. Um, I just talked about you pouring it, the mold conveyor, it's a curing. It's splitting the cope, the top of it goes that way, the bottom of the mold goes that way, and the wheel goes this way. It's pulled out by a crane. It's got a little bit more curing time because this is molten steel. It's got a little shell on it right now, but it's solidifying. And then the first thing it comes to after this conveyor, it's it's kind of got a it's a conveyor that kind of looks like that. It comes to this turntable to reorient it down the hot wheel processing line. So when I'm thinking about what assets to consider for my asset portfolio, I'm looking at this system saying, what are important here? Well, just this particular hot wheel line, I'm looking at these different um, machines, pieces of equipment. And I'm going to focus on this turntable just as an example, because I'd certainly include these assets uh, in uh, my asset portfolio. And going back to the asset type, I've got many turntables in this, so I'd have an asset type turntables that I'm gonna be considering in my portfolio. As I mentioned before, the ISO 55000 gives us the flexibility to determine what physical assets will be included in our system. So things that I absolutely have to have though, when I'm talking about physical assets, and again, this might be a challenge uh, for everyone on the webinar to go back and just ask yourself if you have this. At an absolute minimum, an organization, and I don't mean the entire corporation, I mean just a plant, just a facility, can everyone in the facility agree on what assets we have in the facility? Uh, you might have 5,400, 7,500 different individually identified assets. Each one of those has to have an identification number. So every one of those turntables has its own number. Every one of the cranes has its own number. Every conveyor system has its own number, individually identified, but my organization, my plant agrees we have 5,400 assets and here they are. And then I need to have as a minimum a criticality ranking of those assets. Of these assets, which ones are the most important? Which are the next important? All the way down to what are the least important? And of all of those assets, and this is really good for, uh, this is really good for cost, life cycle cost evaluation. I wanna know what the purchase date is, how much it cost, and how much I've spent to date maintaining it. This isn't uh, spelled out necessarily in ISO 55000, but I'm telling you for asset management, you wanna have this information. If you're gonna manage the asset, you need to have this information. It's not spelled out in the standard, but I can tell you as, a, as, a, as a, making this applicable to organizations, you're gonna to wanna to have this information. Again, just a little tool that I use that might be helpful. It's very common for me when I'm looking for companies to have identified their equipment and based on some all their assets and then have it spelled out in some level of criticality. I'm very likely to see that in what's called a rhyme chart. I don't know if, uh, if the folks on the webinar are familiar with the rhyme chart, but it stands for Ranking Index of Maintenance Expenditures. And over here on the left hand side, it lists all the assets in this particular plant. 
and it gives them a ranking weight of 10 through one. I, I don't know if it goes all the way down to one here, but uh, so I, I, this would be a document that I could work with. Okay, now we understand air compressors are very important for whatever you make. The main water system is very important. Line one and line two, cutting table six. These things are very important to what we do here. And that's those are some of the assets that we would include in our asset maintenance um, or asset management system. In fact, if you remember, I mentioned before that we have to have some documentation that explains the rationale of how we included stuff and how we excluded stuff. The ranking index of maintenance expenditures is a perfect tool that answers that. We made the cutoff at, at seven and below right here. Anything below a seven is not included. Anything eight and above is included. And that is our rationale. And you can bring things in later, or you could take things out later if you want. But to start with, that's our rationale. So I've got this great, by the way, a rhyme chart, if you're not familiar with it, is how companies set up how to determine what the priority of a maintenance job is. Is it a priority one, two, three, four, whatever many priorities you have? The rhyme chart is the tool you use to determine the priority. Your computerized maintenance management system probably does this uh, automatically if you've got that feature turned on, but if you don't, you have to do it manually. Anyway, so this is a great tool for determining what assets are in my asset management systems and which ones are not. Uh, assets identified for inclusion should be significant, should be a significant asset that's necessary for production. I, I wouldn't put the front gate operation, that, that wouldn't be an asset in my system. And again, this is very important. This is, this is where we tie in the assets to achieving the organizational objectives. We haven't talked about organizational objectives in a few minutes. Let me give you an example. If I come to your company and you have an organizational objective that's documented that the board of directors said, here's what we're gonna focus on this year that says we're going to be a leading company in respecting the environment within the communities that we operate. Now, that's an actual organizational objective from an actual client. I would expect, as we're putting together the asset management plan, that I'm looking for assets that will achieve that organizational objective. This objective, the second bullet here, would give us an indication that assets critical to achieving this goal would include dust collectors, wastewater treatment plants, incinerators, anything with the smokestack, uh, fume collectors, air handling units, anything that controls the uh, emissions of anything from my plant, I would expect those assets to be in the asset management system because, again, one of our organizational objectives is to be a leading company in respecting the environmental or the environment within the communities. So that's how I tie in the assets to organizations. Now, some organizational objectives may not have anything to do with their assets, so, so we don't consider those, but we look for the ones that do require the equipment to be running properly. Uh, one of the implied, if not implicit, ideas behind asset management is that everyone in the organization works to ensure those assets are delivering value for the company. Again, they can be tangible or intangible, what we're talking about, uh, the tangible ones. So how do we determine if an asset is delivering value? Well, the easiest way is, uh, uh, is to calculate the availability. I want to mention real quickly that <clears throat> this formula actually comes from Ramesh Galati's book, uh, Maintenance, Best Pract Maintenance and Reliability Best Practices. I want my availability, uh, I want to aim for an availability of greater than 90%. And this is the formula that I would use. Some of you guys might be familiar with the uh, formula OEE, Overall Equipment Effectiveness, where it talks about availability, performance, and quality. If you remember the world-class OEE is 85%, that's an availability of 90%, a performance of 95%, and a quality of 99%. So I, I, I know if my equipment has an availability of 90% using this formula, I, I know intuitively that that asset is delivering on what I expect it to do. Now, it's not 95, it's not 97, because things happen, right? And I have to schedule the machine down and those kinds of things. So 90% is a target I want to shoot for. Another interesting, and this is from Ramesh Galati too, um, maintenance and reliability best practices, is uh, I might want to calculate the reliability of the asset. 
And again, this is a, these are tools. These are just tools that I use to to show the organization that you're getting value for the asset. Otherwise, how would we even know? This is a very important one, and this is probably one I use. Um, I use this or a derivative of this almost every single week in my consulting business. Uh, ideally, we should aim for reliability of 85%. And I want to show you guys real quickly something. I don't want to spend a lot of time on this, but uh, E is the natural log. It's, it's, two, it's a constant. It's 2.71. Lambda, the Greek letter lambda, is 1 over mean time between failure, which is just a reminder we saw on this previous slide. And then T is the time that we want to run a machine. So if I have a motor, just as a calculation, I have a motor that has a mean time between failure of 2,500 hours, continuous hours, if that's my mean time between failure, one over mean time between failure is 0 0.0004. If I want to run this, this motor for 14 days straight, that is 336 hours. If I plug this number and this number here and run this formula, this calculation, I end up with 87.4% reliability. That is to say there's an 87.4% probability but I'm going to get through a 14 day run without a breakdown, without a failure. This is a very important calculation because what happens if I run at less than 85%, that's when I start having equipment asset breakdowns at two o'clock in the morning or on a Saturday or a Sunday or at five o'clock in the evening or nine o'clock in the morning. I start having failures. What I want to do to ensure the asset is delivering what it's supposed to deliver. I need to make sure that I operate it within the window of its design. I've got to look at availability and I've got to look at reliability. These are the two formulas that I use to sort of prove, if you will, that the asset is delivering on the value that we promised it would when we bought it. So these are, uh, or, or some calculation, whatever works for you guys, this, these are the tools that I use again. So here's, if you remember my old, hot, my old train wheel process in that turntable. If you think about it this way, what, what turns the turntable is a hydraulic unit and a cylinder. And when it turns, the, the conveyor rollers turn by a little motor, a little five horsepower motor, and a gearbox. Each of these components has, a, each of the, I got a motor and a gearbox here, each of these have a mean time between failure. I know that I've got a, I know that I make 900 wheels a day, which means this cylinder has to extend and retract 900 times a day. 900 times a day. And here in the United States, we have, uh, I'm going to calculate it out here, we have 344 production. If you run 24 7, you're really running 344 days, counting for holidays and, and downtime for rebuild. That is uh, 344 days times 900 times a day is about 310,000 cycles on that little hydraulic cylinder. Now, guys, I've been around for 35 years. I'm here to tell you right now, they don't make a hydraulic cylinder that can extend and retract 310,000 times in a year. They just don't make it. You're going to get a blow by. You're going to get your uh, clevises wallered out. You're going to have a rod bent. You're going to have something come undone tie rods or something. So I'm probably going to have a cylinder that maybe has 100,000 uh, uh, cycle life of 100,000. I know now that I've got to replace that cylinder at least three times a year. And what's important about this, and I talked about the motor being 2,500 hours. When I have a component failure, it's, it's contingent upon me to go back and say, how long has that asset been there? How long has that component been there? I've got a hydraulic cylinder that's extended and retracted 110,000 times. There's nothing wrong with that cylinder. That, that cylinder performed exactly like it was supposed to. So what's important is on the, on the maintenance and the reliability side, we're the, we're the ones that actually report on the asset health. We're the ones that actually 
tell the organization that asset did exactly what it was supposed to do for as long as it was supposed to do it. There's a really good probability that in your organization, there's nobody else that's going to do that. If we don't have real focus on this, what's going to happen is we have a hydraulic cylinder failure. Nobody knows that it had 110,000 cycles on it. And we're going to be, uh, by maintenance downtime, and we're going to be asked to do a root cause analysis, like a five wire fishbone or something like that, cause and effect to figure out why that cylinder failed. And the answer is going to be, how long did you expect it to last? It was only designed to last 100,000 cycles. So we're the ones that are calculating the asset value promise. And that's why back on the engineering side, even to go further upstream, we want to make sure we get the best cylinder possible because we know that we need to get the most life out of it. And then we got to care for it and operate it properly for sure. So when we're calculating asset value promise, that lies squarely on the maintenance and engineering department. I'll go a little bit further into this. Let's say that we bought this uh, turntable and it costs Eighty thousand U.S. dollars. That that means uh, landed, installed, certified, validated, and uh, startup was eighty thousand dollars. That's represented in my life. By the way, this uh, life cycle graph uh, is an interpretation again from Ramesh Galati's work in his book. Uh, what I want to do, this is just John Ross, when I'm setting up a project, I want the landed price of my asset to represent twenty percent of my life cycle cost. I'm going to have a disposition or, or to get rid of the asset always at 5%. That's pretty much a constant. And that's going to leave me 75% of the life cycle cost to spend on this machine over the, let's see, at the turntable, I'm probably going to have it for 10 years. So if I think about this, if 0.20 X equals $80,000, the life cycle cost, which is X, equals 400000 if I solve for X in this formula. Is four hundred thousand dollars. Again, this is just a tool that I use when I'm explaining to people, uh, organizations, how much um, value you're supposed to get out of a machine. So seventy-five percent of four hundred thousand is three hundred thousand, and this right here will be twenty thousand to, to to cut the turntable out of the ground, grind down the studs, get rid of the turntable. It's going to cost about twenty thousand to have somebody haul it off. It's going to cost twenty thousand U.S. So I've got $300,000 to spend over the next 10 years or about $30,000 a year to maintain a hydraulic unit, a cylinder, a gearbox and a motor, little bearings, some bands, you know, just a roller type conveyor. And now I can take a look at this cost of operating this machine versus what it's producing, and I can make a judgment on if that asset is still providing value to the company. I should never spend more than $400,000 in 10 years on this entire machine. And then at the very end of its life, I make a decision to either keep it, extend it with some capital improvement, extend the life of it, or to get rid of it based on the condition of it. So these are the things, again, these are just some of the tools that I use to help the organization understand, are we getting value for the asset? And I've got to tell you folks, just my experience, this falls squarely on engineering and maintenance because I don't believe there's any other, um, again, I don't know your organizations, but uh, it's very rare that anybody else in the organization is even calculating this. And we've got to make, in fact, we have to document our decision-making asset Asset life decision making process. We have to document that. And this is one of the ways uh, that I, I tend to help uh, or work with organizations that they can document it and explain it to people. Here's how much we're supposed to, here's the value we're supposed to get out of it. Here's how much it's costing us per year. Here's our calculation on return value. And then it's a very simple process and one that you can use for all your assets. Now, finally, down at the, uh, down at the end of our presentation, talk about the strategic asset management plans. And if you remember and recall from the beginning, this is a, this is a, if you were an asset management company, certified asset management company, when I walked in, this would be the document I asked for. Show me your strategic asset management plan. Now it could be plans, you could have several, but show it to me because this is the trans, this is the actual translation of those corporate objectives. Remember, we want to be kind to the environment. Okay, that's how we translate corporate objectives into the actual stuff that we do in maintenance. This is the translation. This is the, I call it the Rosetta Stone, if you guys are familiar with that. 
product, the Rosetta Stone, to teach you how to speak different languages. First of all, let me go down to this bottom bullet here. The SAMP clearly identifies which assets are included within the scope of the asset management system. I, I want to read right off the bat, right when I'm looking at the strategic asset management plan, it's going to clearly tell me what assets are in and what assets are out. And then if I want to see the justification for that, you guys would produce another document. It's a guide and it, 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 it uses a guide, asset, the asset management system and development of the asset management plans. This is what we actually do. Again, what we're translating is, here's what the corporation's focusing on, here's what we're gonna do in maintenance. Sets out the objectives, the process systems, the activities, these are called control activities, and that literally is the stuff we do. That's the preventive, predictive maintenance, uh, planning, scheduling, storeroom functions, all the things that we do in maintenance, that's it right there. Um, it helps uh, the strategic asset management plan is, how are we going to utilize this turntable? How are we going to maintain it and care for it and operate it over the next 10 years? Just to go back to that turntable example that I gave you. The SAMP clearly articulates the link between the organizational objectives and the asset management objectives. Here's what the company's trying to achieve, the three or four things to focus on this year. Here's how we're going to utilize the equipment to make that happen. Uh, I was working with some um, with a trucking company, uh, semi trucks, articulated lorries, I guess they call them in England, um, and they have a fleet of semi truck trailers and semi truck with the tractor part of it. And the corporate objective to be profitable had an idea of how many miles they needed to drive their fleet of trucks at what margin they needed to perform at. So they had a little bit of a margin for error in case they had a, a delayed truck or a flat tire or truck that needed major expense. But when it came down to, to be profitable, we have to do this. The assets we have to work with to achieve that profitability are these trucks. Here's how we're gonna care for them. Here's how we're gonna operate them. Here's, what the, here's how we're gonna train our operators. Here's how we're gonna train our maintenance people. Here's how we're gonna train our, our, our depot folks to take care of the trucks, do heavy maintenance and repair on them. And that's what we have here in the strategic asset management plan. It is a single source document that says what we're gonna to do to ensure that that turntable is available for the next 10 years. It's gonna talk about spare parts. It's gonna talk about uh, capital improvements or modifications. It's gonna talk about controls and all kinds of other things. How we ensure that that turntable is gonna be a viable asset providing value to the company in, for the next 10 years. Again, that's just using my turntable example. Examples of organizational objectives. Again, this is just a rehash from what we talked about earlier. Now, inside of that, and I'm just thinking out loud here, uh, sometimes, uh, yeah, not all of those have to do with uh, physical assets, but certainly profitability, productivity, and customer service. Doesn't matter what you make as far as a product or a service, Probably if you're going to be profitable and increase productivity and provide really excellent customer service, you need your company assets to perform at the highest level. You think about the, the trucking company I just gave you as an example. To be profitable, they need their trucks on the road. To be productive, they probably need their, their people and their trucks to be on the road about 90% of the time. And for customer service, uh, the truck has to show up on time and it has to leave on time. And the truck has to be serviceable when it's there. I can't. I can't have a truck show up at a customer site and I can't get the doors open or the truck won't start. So I've got all kinds of things around the performance of my assets to make these three things happen. So again, I, I set you guys a challenge earlier. I said, uh, see if you can find out what the vision, the value, vision, mission, and organizational objectives are of your organization. Because those aren't, those aren't often very well uh, communicated in most organizations, especially big organizations. You might see it on a website, but see if you can really get a good sense of what it is. So back to our turntable, it has to run at a certain level of availability and reliability in order to deliver on the promise, right? If you remember, I said, uh, I want an availability of 90% and I want a reliability of uh, greater than 85%. And that's how I can ensure that that turntable is providing um, is going to provide uh, the achievement of profitability objectives, productivity objectives, and customer service. 
those are those are pretty high numbers. Now you might think 90% or 85% is not very high for a sort of a world class number, but to hit that number consistently for a year, day in and day out, month in and month out, for an entire year, how about 10 years? That's a very high performing piece of equipment right there. That turntable. If you consider that thing turns, it, it turns 900 times a day to uh, 344 days a year and a year out for the next 10 years. That's a very high performing piece of equipment. Now, I need to make sure that I'm maintaining it and operating it properly. Uh, and again, these are train wheels, so it's 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 a really hot environment. So securing success for the future. I've mentioned this before. Um, the seminal book on maintenance and reliability is Ramesh Galati's publication. Uh, maintenance and reliability best practices. In fact, here's my copy right here. I'd suggest if you're a maintenance or an engineering professional that you have uh, this in your library. This is a great book. He, pro he provides some guidance for the breakout of life cycle cost, and these are represented in two specific graphs. One was for the Department of Defense. Uh, he works for the U.S. Department of Defense, and the other one's for general industry. I'm just going to show you the general industry one here as an example. Uh, he says that when we're designing equipment and we're bringing it into our plant, what we want to look for is design and development uh, and installation cost anywhere from this 15 to 30 percent. Here's that disposal cost. You guys saw a life cycle uh, graph uh, just a few minutes ago on that turntable. And then operations and maintenance anywhere from 65 to 85. Uh, what I've done is I've taken, uh, again, if you remember that uh, life cycle chart, I've taken that. Um, and what I use uh, when I'm designing equipment myself or when I have designed equipment when I was a, as a plant engineer, I'm looking for 20% and 75%. And I find that that's a pretty good mix right there. And I gave you that turntable example. And that gives me some um, sense of how much money I have to spend, per, I have to spend per year to maintain that asset. And if you think about ensuring that the asset uh, is successful for the next, however long we're going to have that asset here, and I've mentioned before, there's only a few things that maintenance can do. We can either run to failure, emergency maintenance. We can do corrective maintenance. We can do preventive maintenance, of which there are seven types of preventive maintenance. In fact, the most important thing that maintenance does is preventive maintenance. That's the number one thing in a maintenance organization does is preventive maintenance. And inside of that, the, the absolute most important thing we do is lubrication. So those are the seven types of preventive maintenance. In addition to that, all we've got left really that we can do is predictive maintenance and the standards are vibration analysis, infrared oil analysis, and ultrasonic. So if we put those on this life cycle chart, we end up with this. So I want to just uh, use this as an example. If you recall, this was at this point, I've got 20% spent on my conveyor. Um, and that was $80,000. That's what it cost to get here. I have my disposal, which is 5%, which is $20,000. This is U.S. I'm going to have $300,000 U.S. to spend over 10 years that this conveyor is going to be here. Or $30,000 a year. You saw the components that are on this conveyor. I've got $30,000. If I spend more than $30,000 a year performing these activities, I know now that I've got to cut a little bit from the next year because I only have $300,000 to spend on this. If, this can, if we've maintained this conveyor properly, we've kept it clean, it's operating just like it's designed, we haven't abused it on the operational side, and we get out here to year seven, and we decide this is really a good conveyor, we want to keep it around a little bit longer, we might do a capital project on it to extend the life another five years. Bring it out here to five years. Maybe put another forty, fifty thousand dollars into it, possibly. Uh, maybe probably more like thirty thousand dollars, I suspect, to get more life out of it. But it's very possible I could get out to year seven on a conveyor that only costs eighty thousand brand new, and I've already spent five hundred thousand dollars maintaining it because I didn't do very good preventive maintenance or predictive maintenance. My corrective maintenance was not very good. 
It's where I find most maintenance organizations perform very poor maintenance, actually. And we end up doing a lot of emergency maintenance, which is four times more expensive than planned maintenance. And that's where we, that's how we end up spending $500,000 on a conveyor that only costs $80,000 brand new. So these are what the standard call control activities. This is the work that we actually do. So uh, our part of asset management is to understand what the organizational objectives are. Again, those are, those are fundamentally come from the values, the vision, and the mission. The organizational objectives. And those are influenced by the stakeholders. So we're actually required by ISO 55000 to identify the stakeholders. What is their influence? What are their needs and expectations? And take those into consideration. Because everyone benefits when we run our equipment properly. When we get 10 years of service out of an $80,000 conveyor, our suppliers who supply parts, our customers who get the train wheels, right, they buy the train wheels from us, our associates benefit because they have a job and they get a paycheck. The community at large is a beneficiary of that because they get uh, a tax base for hospitals and police and schools and things like that. Everyone benefits when we run our operation in accordance with sound uh, maintenance and reliability principles. And all of this is brought together by this asset management system that says everyone is going to be focused around these 150 assets that we've identified through some process. On behalf of Soft Expert, Thank you for the presence of everyone who participated in this event. If you have any questions, please contact the presenter via email. To see other webinars, ebooks, and white papers on this subject, please visit our website at www.softexpert.com. Find out more about Soft Expert solutions for business compliance, innovation, and digital transformation. Thanks for listening. See you next time.